All right, well, good evening, everyone, and thank you again for joining us for our continuation in languages and diversity series. We have with us tonight a guest I am extremely excited about. Um, her name is Dr. Gupta, um, and we met on uh, social media. So it's an amazing way that some of these uh, technologies can connect us even from very distant um, places. And why I connected so readily with Dr. Gupta is her perspective on larger issues in social justice, racial inequality, and socioeconomic inequality. Her perspective is as fresh and as exciting as her topic because she approaches this from the vantage point of food. And so as a huge foodie and as a um, person who's also lived in Michigan and has had friends and family from that area, uh, Dr. Gupta's perspective and message really spoke to me. And we're hoping that through her presentation tonight, that her perspective, not only in regards to social justice and um, the othering and marginalization, um, that she also maybe challenges you to further um, dig into what makes you a unique change agent in tackling some of these major issues and how we can be proponents for change um, locally and on the national stage. So without further ado, um, Dr. Gupta, I'm going to come off camera and mute myself. Okay, thank you so much for the beautiful introduction, Dr. James. Thank you for inviting me here to speak with you all today. I'm so happy to be here and talk to talk to you about something I'm really passionate about, and that's about harnessing your own strengths for social justice. So, as Dr. James said, I am a, I don't know if I actually said this, but we did meet on Instagram where all people meet these days. Um, so I, in addition to running a social media nonprofit uh, called No Immigrants, No Spice, uh, I also am an emergency physician. I currently work at Kaiser Oakland and Richmond over here in the Bay Area in California, uh, and I'm also a new mother. So, so, in a, so I live multiple lives, and part of the reason why I'm giving you guys this talk here today is to get you thinking about all the different lives you live and the different lives you want to live and how to harness your own core strengths towards becoming a social change agent. So just wanna do a little icebreaker, get you all thinking. Um, I don't know if you're near a cabinet, a pantry, a refrigerator, but what I'd like you to do is take one minute and if you're near a refrigerator or a, or a pantry, go, what I want you to do is think about if you were a spice, what spice would you be? spice, condiment, what is like the thing that represents you as a person? And so if you're near a fridge or a pantry, I want you to go get that hot sauce, that condiment, that spice. And if you're not near, if you're not actually in your kitchen, then just get a piece of paper and write it down. I give everyone about one minute to do that. Okay, so I think it's probably been like 30 seconds, but just think about this during the talk. And if you change your mind, you can go and swap out the spice or condiment, but we're going to share at the end. So, again, I want you to think about if you are a spice or you are a hot sauce, what spice or hot sauce would you be and why? And then I'm going to, what I want to do is give you a quick introduction to my nonprofit, and I'm going to do that through this video. Eh, si fuera una especie, sería una especie de canela, porque la canela es, es muy dulce, pero a la vez eh, es cuando consume demasiado, es muy, o sea, pica, 
poco, eh, o sea, tal vez porque así soy yo, soy un poco tímido, eh, así como estoy ahorita. <risa> eh, ya cuando me agarran de malas también este, soy un poco fuerte, o sea, un poco enojado podría decirse. Eh, así. So, we're going to come back to this video at the end of this talk. So, what I'm here to talk about is how we can be multiple different identities. How can you be all the things that you want to be in, as one person? So, let me break it down a little bit using my own life as an example. So, I was born in 1986. I will probably die in 2070. And using this high fidelity graphic that I have drawn for you, uh, I can show you that I am a mother, I'm a nonprofit executive director, and I'm an emergency physician. So to the right of the screen, your right, yeah, there's this vectors going outwards. And that's like the energy of that I'm expending going outwards. If I'm if I'm living three different lives, all that energy is going all over the place. So the point of this talk is to think about how to go from birth to death and be all those things that I want to be. How do you go from graph number one above to graph number two? So, and I think the answer to that is thinking about the spice that keeps it all together. And what is that? That is your core values. So I'm Indian, my, so I'm South Asian. Any person from a South Asian household knows what this is. This is a dapa. So what it is, is this container that has a secret blend of spices that every auntie, every mom has their own, you know, secret blend that makes their food really special. And like a daba, we each have our own special blend of self that makes us who we are. And that's what I call our core values. So what are your core values? What make you, what makes you, you? And it's a, it's actually a lot more difficult than you might think. So in preparation for this talk, I spent many hours journaling, talking on the phone to the people in my life. They're important to me and saying, what is it that really defines me? Like, who am I? And what it comes down to is my core values myself are centered around, you know, I'm empathetic. I have a strong sense of social justice and fairness. I have a strong love of people, a desire to be creative and think outside the box high levels of disorganization, anxiety, uh, and impulsiveness. So those, like, if you were really to write down me on a piece of paper, those are, those are the qualities that one would ascribe to me, good and bad. That's just who I am. So if your core values are who you are, the anchors in your life are the people that keep you accountable to who you want to be. So again, we have the dhaba, this beautiful blend of spices that make me who I am, my core values. And the anchors in my life are my friends and family, you know, my husband, my best friends, my sister, my mother, my extended family. And your anchors are really important. There's, there's something called Putnam's theory of social capital and what this philosophy basically says is that you are who you are connected to. So you need to choose your anchors carefully. Sometimes your anchors choose you, but you have agency. So you need to be careful with who you choose because these are the people that become the echo chamber of who you are. So kind of keep that in mind. And then I want to pivot for a moment just to talk about something called effective altruism. So one can presume that all people want to do good at a, at a base level almost all people want to do good in the world so effective altruism is the science of doing good and so according to this framework when one is choosing a problem to work on in society one sh it should be one of it should have meet three criteria so it should be one that is great in scale and affects many people a problem that is highly neglected and highly solvable so this is your opportunity to combine yourself, your core values with effective altruism to become a problem solving machine. So I'm gonna use myself as an example. So this is the place where I can take my own special blend of self, 
You know, I'm someone who is creative, empathetic. Uh, I communicate and I love through food. That's like my love language. And, you know, I'm also a bit of a social media narcissist. These are some of the qualities that make me who I am. And the problem I have chosen to work on is xenophobia. According to effective altruism, this xenophobia fits the three criteria of a problem that is worth solving. So it is great in scale. Xenophobia affects millions of people in this country. It is highly neglected. So the part of xenophobia that's highly neglected is the telling the positive story of immigration. And it, it is highly solvable with the right people and right, right components in place. It is highly solvable. And, you know, some of these images are the images that were floating around in the media when I started my nonprofit. And that was when Donald Trump was elected, the Muslim ban was happening, we were seeing kids in cages. And that's when I started No Immigrants, No Spice. So what No Immigrants, No Spice is, is a 501c3 nonprofit that brings people together around food. So using food as a vector to tell stories, this is our way of approaching and dismantling xenophobia. And so we do this, like we do this through social media now more because of COVID, but pre-COVID we were doing this through different arenas, like this large event we had called Barbecue Without Borders. So it was a series of events leading up to this. And this was, there were about 500 people there. It brought together a wide diverse array of people from the Bay Area to center around barbecue. But it was barbecue, not no hot dogs, no hamburgers. It was Indonesian flash fried fish. It was barbacoa tacos from an undocumented Mexican women owned kitchen. It was um, oh, Northern Iranian pomegranate molasses chicken wings. So it was these six different chefs who all did their own regional riff on barbecue. And then we had you know, a run of show that had like Indonesian dancers and Mexican singers and, you know, playing out, showing their culture in a very rich, beautiful, community driven way. And it, and these are the chefs actually, that's Siska from Indonesia, Hanif from Northern Iran, and the women of La Guerrera's Kitchen, which is an undocumented migrant women kitchen here over in the Bay Area. And so we were telling we were able to give them all a platform. They were able to come and share their story in multiple different ways through music, through dance, through food. Everyone got to taste this amazing food, but also under, hear the story of Hanif, who had been separated from his wife for four years because of the Muslim ban, because his wife lived in Iran, and Siska, who had a lot of problems as a migrant wo woman from Indonesia and some of the barriers she faced, and then the undocumented women from La Guerrera's Kitchen, who are loudly and proudly undocumented and living openly in the Bay Area. So that was, you know, so all these things are happening simultaneously. So this is my work with the nonprofit. And at the same time, I'm still working full time as an emergency physician. Part of the inspiration for starting No Immigrants, No Spice is the fact that I was seeing undocumented patients coming to the ER much later and much sicker due to fear. So it's 2016, Trump is elected and there's waves of xenophobia and just total fear and paralysis in the community. And I live in a, a sanctuary city and people are just terrified to come to the ER and still are because they were worried about being deported. So I'm seeing people coming in with preventable, preventable DKA, heart attacks, strokes, you name it. And so no immigrants, no spice was a way for me to address a lot of that xenophobia, but the work in the community really informed my work as a physician. So I started, you know, I really started talking and focusing on immigrant health and healthcare disparities. And so I gave talks at, I've been giving different talks and doing different workshops, started podcasting and, and it's actually really improved my, it's made me feel much less burnt out in a strange way, because I feel I can work as an emergency physician and really focus on this issue and feel not just like I'm sending my patients out into the wilderness. Like I feel more connected to the community and I think that makes me a better physician. And then <laughs> motherhood. Uh, so you, you have all these things going on. So I'm running a, a nonprofit full-time, I'm working full-time and then, you know, I get pregnant and 
anybody who's been pregnant and had morning sickness knows that everything stops. And that's how it was for my whole first trimester. And then, you know, go through to the fourth trimester. So I'm postpartum and I have my baby. And for someone who is functioning at basically a hypo hypomanic level, like many of us in medicine do, sometimes the hardest thing to do is to just stop. But that's what motherhood forced me to do. And so I really was just home with my baby, not working at that time. Actually, she's a COVID baby. So I was pulled out of the ER when I was pregnant and off work um, and really not doing the nonprofit. And I, you know, I had kind of a crisis. I said, okay, so this is it. It's me and baby now. And in those like lonely, sleepless nights, some of the things that just kept coming back to were my core values and cliche as it is. I kept thinking about what kind of world is my child going to grow up in? What, what kind of, how do I want to make this world better for her? And that actually inspired me to start uh, the next campaign that I did with No Immigrants, No Spice. And so this was all centered around postpartum justice. So there, this was a campaign I did with an organization called Mothers for Postpartum Justice, and it was twofold. On the one hand, we were doing educational an educational component where we were um, we were educating people about the health disparities seen in black communities with the high rates of morbidity and mortality in black mothers. And on the other side of it, we were raising money and harnessing traditional postpartum knowledge that you see in many immigrant communities and kind of connecting that in an educational way and raising money tangibly for delivery of healthy, nutritious meals to at-risk mothers. So, you know, my, my work, my work as a mother informs my work with the nonprofit, my work with the nonprofit informs my work as a physician and my work as a physician informs both. And so you see the energy in some ways, it, it's all about working smarter and not working harder. So yeah, I'm working in all three of these realms, but they're all coming together to work together. And so this is the framework for which I approach different issues that come up. So some current issues are the rise in, in uh, violence against Asian elders, as well as the health disparities that we're seeing in the immigrant community related to COVID-19. And so, you know, with the response, so in the Bay Area, we have a very large East Asian population, huge Chinatowns, little Saigon, little Korea town over here in Oakland. So, you know, we focused on some, some Asian restaurants, including this one run by Chef Sunny Bay, who is Korean and runs a family restaurant over in Oakland and is someone who has no idea how to use social media. And so what we were able to step in and do is provide a platform for her. And, you know, we put this, some social media bites out and it got picked up by a big blog uh, over in the Bay area. and you know, it started to turn into connections and we'd be able to network for her and get her some more opportunities. And, you know, in response to the COVID-19 health disparities as an emergency physician, you know, as we're seeing these tremendous disparities happening with our frontline workers who are people who are disproportionately black, brown, and or undocumented, I really started talking about this more in my work and became part of a working group within my own hospital system, which is Kaiser Permanente. And so we've created a policy. So everyone from security to nurse to provider to leadership, everybody knows that patients are protected under the Fourth Amendment. And the Fourth Amendment provides protection against unreasonable search and seizure, and that extends to hospital safe spaces. And it's it's just educating people about the facts and kind of integrating law and medicine. And this is something that we really need to be aware of as providers. And, and again, reminding people that HIPAA protects against disclosure of sensitive health information, which includes immigration status. So it's also important, you know, for me as a physician to educate other people that, yeah, you should never document someone's immigration status in the chart. Why? Because that could be used against them in deportation proceedings 10 years from now. We don't know who's going to be in power. So it's just things that I would want to know as a provider. I've now become aware of because of my work with the nonprofit. 
And then just more recently in the post COVID world, we just started doing small events again. And this was like a small safe event that we did with um, three different Latinx owned kitchens in Oakland and brought together, you know, the movers and shakers of this city, uh, like musicians and activists and city council members. And we did like a food tour that went to these three different kitchens and gave these women a platform. So this is Rosa Gonzalez. She's a she's a chef who's from El Salvador and she was able to sit down with us and tell us about her migration story, what she had to go through, what it's like to be a person without documentation, what it's like to run a restaurant during COVID-19. And it was, you know, a way to give her dignity to tell her story and also be able to provide her with provide her the opportunity to feed people, which is something she's so proud of. And so it's a beautiful thing. And so I want to come back to the original exercise that we had talked about, and that was uh, I'd asked you all to grab a condiment. Um, so I'd like everyone to come off, come on camera if you can for a moment. You guys, turn your cameras on. Don't be shy. There we go. Okay. So how do I make this gallery bigger? Can you all see each other? Okay. Well, I just want you to you can come off camera or come on camera and also take yourself off mute if you want to speak, but I just want everyone to show what spice or condiment they would choose or the piece of paper you wrote it down on. Chipotle. Okay. I see Chipotle. Dr. James, do you want to tell us why you chose Chipotle? I actually um, really chose Ch uh, Chipotle cumin spice mix because it's some of my favorite tastes in all sorts of foods. And I'm not, I couldn't narrow it down to just one. So we'll allow that. That's acceptable. So if I was a spice, I would choose, I would probably also choose cumin. I think it's something ubiquitous. It's strong. Uh, it can be a little overwhelming. It's a, uh, it's essential. I think it's essential too. Anyone else want to share? Tiana chose, chose seven spice. That. Seven spice is a Seven. like a Middle Eastern Mediterranean spice that my family always uses. So we use it in a lot of like different dishes. So I find it very reliable. I think like if my family or friends described me, I'd be a, like a reliable person. That's beautiful. I love that. Thank you. Radha, do you have something? Tajin. Yes. Why'd you pick that? Not gonna lie, it was just on my desk. Um, I just have it all the time for everything, so it's essential. And it's essential. It's essential. <laughs> yeah, it's a good spice. It's amazing. I love tagine. I just I just discovered it like six months ago. I never knew how badly I needed it in my life. Well, actually, my dad introduced me to it because I always just put um we just eat a lot of mangoes. So we put a lot of salt and um just chili peppers in general, but with uh to, to Jean, it's just like, it's just something different about it. So just been using on yeah. every type of fruit or anything I can get my hands on. It just goes on it. I love that. Yes, spice on fruit, so good. I regularly, when I travel, I I buy over there uh, some spices from Panama, Panama City, Panama. 
it's called caldo rica. It's a mix of chicken, spices, um, peppers. Um, I don't know. I always cook with that. Uh, the chicken, the rice you can make with that, the beef. I put in everything and, and get a very good flavor, a very good taste, and you cannot find it here. Uh -huh. Is that something you grew up cooking with? Excuse me? Is that something you grew up cooking yes. with a lot? Oh, absolutely. In yeah. In my country, everybody used that. Okay. Beautiful. Thank you. I just wanted to read uh, Kathy's comment in the chat. Salt, plain, basic, works hard and everywhere. And I have salt and pepper hair. Love it. <laughs> I love that. That's perfect. <laughs> Anyone else want to share or should we move on? Okay. Thank you all. Hey. Originario de de la ciudad de Guatemala. Eh, en Guatemala fue cuando decidí emigrar a, a México, Tapachula, México. Fue donde yo, eh, mi pareja y yo, decidimos empezar todo para poder llegar a los Estados Unidos. Y nos quedamos en Tapachula trabajando por un tiempo. Eh, luego fue cuando nos encontramos con la caravana. Ya de la caravana pasamos varios lugares hasta llegar al a la ciudad de a la ciudad de México y poder abordar lo que son los los vagones del tren eh, llamados la bestia y fue cuando ya bajamos eh, viajamos a diferentes puntos de ciudades de ciudades de México hasta llegar a Tijuana y en Tijuana fue cuando nosotros eh, decidimos entregarnos a los oficiales de migración y pues un poco un poco triste eh, pero a la vez fue bonito así porque al menos yo me sentía me sentía bien porque dije decíamos con mi pareja bueno va a ser algo algo bien para nosotros porque estando allá podemos vivir tranquilos y así o sea me sentía triste a la vez y contento porque venía con él y viajamos en todo el tiempo. no no podíamos estar Entonces, en Guatemala, por discriminación de la familia y de los amigos, eso no podemos. So, that is a story that if I were to summarize that in one sentence, this is a young man named David uh, that I got to work with through a legal services firm called Pangea Legal Services. And he agreed to be videotaped because he had petitioned for asylum and had been granted asylum. So he was okay with being shown on camera and sharing this story. So if I summarize David's story in one line, young man flees Guatemala, young gay man flees Guatemala, comes to the United States, perilous journey, uh, makes case for asylum. It really doesn't, it's a, a headline you've probably seen a thousand times, but you know, it doesn't make much of an impression. But I think that's the point of the work that we're doing with my nonprofit, which is trying to rehumanize people. There's been a systematic dehumanization of undocumented folks um, to make them seem like aliens. That's why people use the word alien all the time. It doesn't seem human. But by showing you this video in the beginning where David's talking about if he was canela, if he was cinnamon, he's like a little, you know, sweet but spicy. I mean he's and then you know he's you can see he's like smiling, he's got braces, he's a young man who's like full of life, full of desires. He wants to live safely and safely and peacefully with his partner. 
and he couldn't live at home because of discrimination and a well-founded fear of persecution from his own family and friends. And he doesn't go into everything he's been through. And he doesn't also go into, I mean, he later tells me all about his mom's tamales and how much he loves them and how hard it is to eat tamales here because they're not his mom's. So the point is that he's a real human being and that's the work. The work is to try to show people as they truly are. So that is my presentation. Um, so we're on social media. Just but, uh, if you check us out on Instagram, you can see a lot of the work that we do. Um, but yeah, the, the goal of this talk is really just to bring this back to each and every one of you to think, you know, you're at this incredible inflection point in your life, you're in medical school, you're just inundated with work and text and clinicals and deadlines, and you're, you have all these tools that are going to make you into an amazing physician, I'm sure. But don't forget there are also other parts of yourself that we want to keep alive and think about because you are your own special, unique person with your own point of view, and you can really be an agent of change. And, you know, Rudolf Virchow said, uh, the physician is the natural attorney for the poor. And he said that in the 1800s because he was trying to eradicate poverty as a social determinant of health. But I think his words still ring true for all of us. And I think truly for the most vulnerable people, we can be their natural and, you know, the last resort for a lot of people to be their attorneys, to be their advocates. So I hope that you got something out of this, if nothing else, to think about some other spices or things you want to eat. I am so glad that you provided Dr. Gupta the opportunity for our group to ask questions, um, especially since it is a um, smaller, more intimate gathering this evening. And so I'd like to open the floor for any of our participants or attendees to ask away. And if everybody is uh, wanting to mold things over, I actually had a question to start. Um, Dr. Gupta, thank you so much. I, again, I, your perspective around such huge topics of xenophobia and the marginalization of immigrant populations really speaks to me. Um, food is often dismissed as being, you know, insignificant or just one more thing we need to do. Can you speak to the power of how a basic, filling a basic ph um, physiological need like eating has allowed your nonprofit and your work to bring people together? Yeah, um, you know, I, I really think that the dinner table is the best place to have hard conversations to it's, I think food is really like a natural way to bring people together. Sometimes, for example, like, Many Americans, like I'm from Michigan, I grew up in East Lansing in like a very predominantly, it was like a farm country, farm town. But a lot of people like their knowledge of other cultures truly might have been limited to just the food that they've had. And, and that can make a huge impression. It really can. Um, you know, on a granular basis, if you have like, I don't know, a delicious home cooked meal provided to you from, from someone, I don't know, from another country that you've never met before, that can make it make a gigantic impression. I think that can be extrapolated into bigger things. So, you know, like leveraging foodie culture, which is very, you know, we foodie. Like if you look on Instagram, see what's trending. It's like always food videos. Like people love talking about food. It's something we all want to do and we all relate to. So I think that has helped be a bridge to talk about immigration. So I can show you a beautiful dish of tacos and a parrot with a story of the person who made those tacos. Um, so, yeah, I think it's really important. I think food is extremely important. I also think nutrition is so important and like so much a part of health, like, you know, talking about postpartum justice. Why are we having like we have terrible maternal morbidity and mortality in this country? And I think nutrition is a huge part of that. So. Yeah, I don't think it should be dismissed. 
Uh, Tiana says, what are some diversity issues you witnessed yourself within the medical field as you went through the process of being an ER physician? Ooh. Okay, um, all kinds of things. I mean, I am, so first of all, I am a woman of color. Um, and as a woman of color in medicine, it's, I faced all kinds of interesting, I've been in all kinds of interesting situations. Um, I've witnessed being an, I have been a medical student in a, in an institution where I felt uh, disempowered because I was a woman. And I think because I was a woman of color um, and had to navigate how to deal with precept, a preceptor who I did not think respected me because of those qualities or respected any of us in my medical school cohort. Um, as a resident, I have seen co-residents and attendings talk about patients in a dehumanizing way. Uh, I trained in New York City at NYU. That was my residency. So, you know, we had a large homeless population uh, and a large Latinx population. And so, you know, you do have a lot of people coming in with many people come in with dizziness, but why is it just the Latinx patients who are, you know, made to, it, it's made to seem that they are the ones who are dramatic or, you know, I don't even want to repeat the things that are said, but I'm sure as you go through training, people will say things that are stereotypes. Um, I've seen a lot of stereotypes being used. Um, other issues. Yeah. I mean, I think. I think part of it is, you know, when you just have a large load of patients as an ER physician, um, especially in a large city like New York, just as a way to like decompress people like make jokes and try to have some levity, but it's often at the expense of the most vulnerable person. So I've had to navigate that, um, those issues. And now as an attending um, and, you know, on faculty in our own, group in this very progressive place. I live in Oakland, California. What we see is our patients are most like 50% of our patients are black in Richmond, California. We only have one African American staff physician in a group of 69, uh, which is ridiculous. So what I've started a myself and another colleague, we started an equity inclusion diversity committee and we're we're like really ramping up our efforts to have our physicians better represent our patients. And, and I think we're making some headway. So I think that answers your question, Tiana. Yeah. And to, to piggyback off of Tiana's question, given these negative and sometimes really um, discouraging experiences, how do you then take those experiences or what are some of the characteristics that you have found to be helpful and becoming an advocate, not only for your patients or for your colleagues, but very importantly for yourself. For every bad encounter, there's probably five or six that undo that in my mind. I, I'm first of all, I'm a glass half full kind of person. I I just am. Um, so yeah, I had, I might have had a creepy attending or a racist person I had to deal with in uh, my faculty, but. I take energy and from the people around me that I work with and surround myself with, with people I think are working in the right way. Um, me myself, I mean, I'm in therapy. I think everyone should be in therapy. That's how I, that's how I think you have to navigate the world is have a safe, sp safe space to like deconstruct what you're going through. Um, but I think also I, I have a lot of hope. I think there are a lot of people who are talking about EID issues and making it, you know, we can, medicine is starting to move along with social movements that are happening. Um, and I think like the qualities, I think they're like, how do you build resilience? It's about like, when I'm feeling empty, I have to fill myself up with something that I care about. So. Like, for example, I, I enjoy language a lot and I'm starting, I'm, I'm in like intensive Spanish tutoring um, because I, I enjoy that. So I'm reading the little prints in Spanish. So when I get really stressed out, 
I start painstakingly translating it just because it's something that gets my mind focused on one thing and helps me like engage a creative part of my mind. So those are the things I do to blow off steam and keep going. That might answer your question. Ooh, Radha has a great question. How do you navigate being the idea of a model minority as a woman of color? Yeah, I think the model minority myth is, I mean, it's rooted in, it's rooted in a in anti-blackness uh, that has been a tool used to divide people. Um, so yeah, I am part of this model minority. I think it's a total myth and it does disservice to us. So I guess the way I navigate it is I don't assume, so there's a, so you can be a minority and you can be an underrepresented minority in medicine. And so I don't, I am considered, I am not considered an underrepresented minority as a South Asian person. Um, I think it's important to, there's a lot of people who don't realize that, um, especially like very well-meaning people in positions of power who end up inevitably are, can be um, white men uh, who think that by putting me on a committee that it solves a prob the problem that, for example, we don't have um, enough African-American physicians. And, you know, I think it's my job as my job to say, actually, we need to better reflect our patients and our patients are overwhelmingly black and Latinx. So how do we bring more of our well-deserving colleagues in to take better care of our patients? I think, so I think allyship is really important. Um, and yeah, I guess just, and, and with anything, like it's, it's not about cultural sensitivity. I think it's about cultural humility. So I am not, I cannot presume to walk in another person's shoes, but I can be an extremely humble, listener. I can listen more both to my patients and to my colleagues. I think that's that's the way I navigate around it. Great questions, everyone. Are there any more? Let's not be shy. What about in relation to even just starting your nonprofit? What are some of the resources like for the nitty gritty of like funding and um, allyship across different um, professional groups? Like, how did you even rally those resources around you? Yeah, um, well, it started because I saw a Trevor Noah skit where he talks about if you hate immigrants, you're not allowed to eat their food. Uh, and all you're allowed to do is eat potatoes. Um, and so I, and he said the words like, no immigrants, no spice. So it started with, I sent an email to his lawyers and said, I'm going to start a nonprofit and put this on a t-shirt. And then I got a five, I just started to think, okay, if I'm gonna do anything, I need a 501c3, which is a tax exempt status, because that opens you up to grants and large companies like tech companies who want to, you know, write off large amounts of money, they'll just donate to charity. So I realized I needed to do that step. That was a huge hurdle. That's like a year of work, um, but got that. And then once I had that in place, it was, it kind of just became like grassroots and organic. So I went to my employer and I said, you know, I'm doing this type of work. Do you want to donate to it? And just figuring out how to also kind of become, I don't know, the money person and, being able to like pitch all the time, like you, I get into rooms with people and they'd be like, oh, this is Dr. Gupta and this is what she's doing. And I had to like have an answer right away for like why this work is important. Um, but a lot of it was, a lot of it's been just very natural and people reaching out in really like-minded ways and partnering um, with other people with similar missions and kind of letting it grow organically. Um, and then also I got a random anonymous donation of $25,000, which was from a community foundation that is working um, 
had a lot of interest in taking care of of immigrant patients. Um, and so I don't know why exactly I got it, but they sent me that money and that has been, that was wonderful. And so things like that just kind of happen. A little bit of hustle, a little bit of hustle here and there. Kathy asks, where do you think or want your journey will take you next? It's a great question. I think I'm at the point right now where I'm trying to figure out how to be all these things. Um, and, and I think it's just trying to not overthink it. And what I'm doing now is reaching out to like-minded organizations who might be doing the same work and kind of not doing it all in my own learning how to like let go of control, like let the baby go a little bit. Um, I think what will happen next is I'd really like to do another in-person event it's just i'm not i'm not at the point where i'm willing to do one that's like the idea of having an event with greater than 50 people gives me anxiety so um i think right now the next the next natural step might be doing like focused filmed um pieces like i'm thinking about for example like everybody cuts a mango in a different way mm -hmm. so like presenting you know, 10 different people with like, how would, here's a tool, here's a mango, go for it. And just seeing how people, what people do with it and putting it out there. I think like simple, simple things around food and uh, in diversity is kind of where I'm going next. Let's see. Radha, have you had any experiences with your nonprofit that have made you reformulate your approach to reaching out to different immigrant communities? Yes. Um, I think my experiences with my nonprofit have made me much more humble. Uh, first of all, I said that I enjoy speaking Spanish. I can understand Spanish. I am much more now. Ever since I started the nonprofit, I'm using a translator, always. I'm not a C2 level uh, Spanish speaker, so I do not want to do a disservice to my patients. Whereas, I think I what I got to realize is like there's so many there's so much about like being um, a lot of patients that I've taken care of, like Colombian patients and folks from Peru and like there's a lot of like humility and not wanting to like disrupt or be rude and be um simpatica so people may not understand what I'm saying but won't feel like they can speak up and and I started to really realize that with my work at the nonprofit and so now I'm so adherent to using a translator even if it's something that I can definitely talk through like just not abdominal pain um that's one thing. And I think it's given me an insight into different populations that are now here. Um, like there's a lot of different Pan-Asian communities, like there's a La Laotian population that's here in Oakland and what they, what the barriers that they face versus, you know, people who've been here multiple generations. It's just a different approach and under taking like a trauma informed approach to, to people who I know are overwhelmingly refugees. Uh, we have a huge Eritrean population, so from Eritrea and Ethiopia, as you know, they're, they're in a civil war right now. And having a little more, it's given me a little more insight and sensitivity into questions around sexual assault and, um, you know, knowing, knowing that the majority of people who are from Eritrea have had some have experienced some sort of severe trauma. Uh, it just informs my approach when I talk to them and I interview them. So, yeah. You're welcome. We'll take one more if anybody has 
Any other burning questions before we sign off for the evening? Well, again, Dr. Gupta, thank you so much for your time and sharing your time with us and giving us some of your positive energy um, from your neck of the woods. And we're very grateful for the opportunity to hear your perspectives this evening. And I want to thank each of you as a participant um, for spending this time with us. Your plates are very full. And so we appreciate the time that you've um, spent to sit down and think about some of these things as you continue not only to study and grow in your respective fields, but to continue to be unique change makers in your spaces. Um, have a good night, everyone, and thanks again. Bye-bye. Hope to see you guys next time. Thank you all. Thank you, Dr. Good.